Okay, so on today's show, we have a jam-packed show for you. Welcome to the African History Network show. It is Sunday, April 23rd, 2023, and we are live. Calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. So some of you all saw the interview that I did earlier today with Tony Browder on our social media platforms, the African History Network, the African History Network, and the YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel. We talked a, a lot about history. We dealt with uh, why Nile Valley civilization history uh, matters. And we talked about African queens. And we also uh, discussed some uh, about Cleopatra the Seventh and um, who she was. Uh, born in 69 BC, um, after the Greeks conquered in 332 BC, we talked about Alexander the Greek, et cetera. Okay. So I'm going to share an excerpt of that, uh, interview that I did with Tony. The whole broadcast is over two hours. You can watch it on our social media platforms or visit our website, the African history network.com, the African history network.com. We have it right on the homepage. So many, many of you all saw me on Roland Martin unfiltered on Friday, uh, April 21st, and we discussed the uh, controversy surrounding the second installment of African Queens. African Queens is a uh, documentary series, a docudrama series from executive producer Jada Pinkett Smith. And uh, the first installment dealt with Queen Nzinga of um, Matampa or modern day uh, Angola. And, you know, we interviewed uh, Professor James Small about that a couple months ago because Professor James Small, one of my teachers, he was the uh, one of the historical consultants on the first installment dealing with Queen and Zynga. The second installment, which debuts May 10th, deals with um, Cleopatra the Seventh. OK, now this is a period of time after the Greeks conquer uh, is no longer called Kemet. Uh, we know Alexander the Greek, or what they call Alexander the Great. There was nothing Greek. There was nothing uh, great about him. We call him Alexander the Greek. Um, he conquers uh, Egypt in 332 BC. Conquer, conquers Kemen in 332 BC, and this is basically when we look at the beginning of Egypt. Egypt is a Greek word. Um, we know one of the original names was Kemet, meaning land of the blacks, or Tameri, meaning the beloved land. Okay, so. There's a good article from Variety.com written by Tina uh, Garabi, who is the director of this episode of African Queens. And she asked the question, um, what bothers you so much about a black Cleopatra? What bothers you so much about a black Cleopatra? And actress Adele James portrays Cleopatra uh, at one point uh, when the casting for the 1963 movie Cleopatra, which Elizabeth Taylor portrayed Cleopatra, at one point uh, they were looking at uh, Dorothy Dandridge to portray Cleopatra. OK, so we're going to talk some about this on today's show. Uh, I'm going to let you hear an excerpt uh, from Roland Martin Unfiltered. When, when I discuss this, I'm waiting for them to make that a separate segment so it could go viral. You know, the segment that we did um, on Roland's show that dealt with um it, it was uh, a white woman that was uh uh she verbally assaulted an african-american woman um and that 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 segment got 1.9 million views so hopefully the one that we did dealing with cleopatra on roland martin and filter hopefully that gets 1.9 million views as well or more than that should get more than that okay so uh we'll, we'll discuss this topic uh, also and get into some history. And then the uh, movie uh, Chevalier, the movie Chevalier about Joseph Ballone. Uh, Joseph Ballone is known as the uh, Chevalier um, of, of France. And he was a famous swordsman uh, in France. Uh, he was born in Guadeloupe. Uh, he is, uh, his father was a, a white Frenchman. And um, he's known as the Chevalier uh, de Saint Georges of France. Okay, so the, the, the new movie uh, that just came out, Chevalier, is about his life and it's about the uh, French Revolution as well. So we're going to talk some about uh, that history uh, also. Okay, uh, I reached into my archives and I pulled out an interview that I did with. Uh, 
a great historian who's now an ancestor, Renoko Rashidi. I did this interview April 17th, uh, 2014, back when I was on Blog Talk Radio. And we talked about uh, the Black Madonna and Child. Uh, we talked about uh, uh, a number of different topics, but we started out talking about Chevalier, uh, Joseph Boulogne, okay? And we were discussing a series of articles that uh, Renoko Rashidi had written for um, AtlantaBlackStar.com, AtlantaBlackStar.com. And one of those articles was on uh, Joseph Boulogne. Boulogne. Uh, he also wrote an article dealing with the Black Madonnas uh, in Europe. And we know that the Black Madonnas in Europe come from uh, Asar, Aset, and Heru, who the Greeks called Osiris, Isis, and Horus. Okay. Um, so we wrote uh, a, a number of different articles uh, for AtlantaBlackStar.com. So we discussed this uh, back on uh, April 17th, 2014, and uh, Renoko called in from France. He was, he was in France. Uh, we know he has a daughter um, that lived in France. And unfortunately, Renoko passed away um, August of 2021. He was uh, doing a tour in Egypt and uh, passed away. Okay, so I reached into our archives. I've interviewed some of everybody I have. Um, I need to put these uh, uh, interviews in another format. I interviewed Dr. Francis Crest Wilson three times. I have numerous interviews with Professor James Small, uh, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene. I interviewed Dr. Uh, Richard King, um, the psychiatrist. I interviewed uh, uh, with Dr. Richard King, Dr. Wade Nobles, uh, uh, who else? Um, some people passed away. Dr. Fukiao. I uh, have a number of interviews that I've done uh, with uh, scholars, scholars and historians and authors throughout the year. And I even interviewed Bernadette Stannis, Thelma from Good Times, interviewed her twice. OK, so we'll talk some about the new movie Chevalier and Dr. Uh, Ray Winbush went to go see that movie. He posted about it on his Facebook fan page, the African History Network. I shared that uh, article. Uh, I, I shared the uh, his Facebook post on our fan page, the African History Network. And uh, we're going to get Dr. Ray Winbush back on the show. We've had him on twice before. Uh, he's a psychologist and a historian also. Now, uh, in addition to that, I was on Faraji Muhammad's show, The Culture, back on April 11th, 2023, earlier this month. And we discussed uh, spanking children as a holdover from slavery and was not traditionally practiced in West Africa. Spanking children is a holdover from slavery and not traditionally practiced in uh, West Africa. Um, and there was a article from Ture, the culture critic Ture, uh, for the griot.com that dealt with this topic. And uh, Ture uh, cited uh, Dr. Stacy Patton, Dr. Stacy Patton, and I'd seen some work from uh, Dr. Stacy Patton uh, uh, throughout the years, also, and uh, I'm going to share that segment with you from uh, the culture with uh, Faraji Muhammad, where we got where we got into this discussion. Okay, now the call-in number is uh, 313-778-7600. If you um, have a question or comment. And on the African History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world, because right now it corrects your own behavior. What you do for yourself, what you do to yourself, and what you allow other people to do to you and get away with is based upon what you think about yourself. What you think about yourself is based upon what you have been taught about yourself. What you've been taught about yourself is based upon everything you've read, heard, and seen about yourself. So when you control the radius of a man or woman's thoughts, you can chose the comforts of his or her actions because the mind can't do or teach what it doesn't know. Now, we deal with a number of different topics here on the African History Network show. We deal with current events and history and politics, education, economic empowerment, entrepreneurship, relationships, love, sex, health issues, and much, much more. Sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T. Wait to sign up for our email newsletter. Text the word Kemet, K-E-M-E-T, the 22828. To sign up for our email newsletter, also visit our website, 
theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. And you can register for the online classes that I teach. We, uh, we had some uh, great classes uh, today and yesterday as well. Uh, earlier in the week, I spoke uh, to a law school class. I did a virtual presentation for the Third Good Marshall Law School. Um, uh, it's a law school uh, in Houston, Texas. Uh, uh, Professor uh, Brother Kendaka. Uh, Peters invited me to speak, uh, Brother uh, Obi Agabuna, uh, Brother uh, Obi, who we've had on the show uh, a number of times over the years. Uh, they wanted to discuss reparations, so they had me do a virtual presentation. That went really well. That was on Wednesday. And then Thursday, uh, Thursday, April 20th, I spoke for the um, uh, Equal Justice Alliance of Michigan, okay, Sister uh, uh, Lacey Dawson asked me to uh, speak and we did a virtual presentation. It's actually on our Facebook fan page because they broadcasted it on their fan page, uh, Equal Justice Lions of Michigan, EJAM. So you can check that out as well. All right, we're coming up on a break. Uh, when we come back, we're going to uh, talk about uh, Queen Cleopatra the Seventh. deal with some of that history. I'm going to let you hear what happened on Roland Martin Unfiltered when we discuss this. And the director of the uh, second installment of the African Queens series, uh, her name is uh, Tina Garavi. Uh, Tina has uh, responded to uh, the criticism uh, surrounding a melanated um, Queen uh, Cleopatra the Seventh. And she asked the question, what bothers you so much about a black Cleopatra? You listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. The History Network show, we focus on educating and empowering and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world. A lot of people don't know what the hell they're talking about. They may have an area of expertise, but some people need to learn how to stay in their own lane. If you don't know, just say you don't know. So we have a lot to talk about, so we're going to jump right into this. Catch it all right here on 910 AM Superstation. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation, the Future Radio. I'm your host, Brother Michael M. Hotep. It is Sunday, April 23rd, 2023, and we are live. Call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. Okay, um, we're going to go to this clip here. Uh, Doug, I'm sending you this text. Uh, start the clip at the, we need to start it at the uh, one hour, 21 minute and 19, uh, uh, one hour and 19 second uh, mark. So let me uh, hit you with this, uh, Doug, just a second. Yeah, one hour, 21 minute, 19 second mark. Okay, uh, we'll go to that in just a minute. So there's been a lot of talk on uh, social media dealing with the, uh, second installment in the series African Queens uh, that is on Netflix. Uh, the first installment is on Netflix right now. This with Queen and Zynga. And the second installment debuts May 10th, May 10th, 2023. Um, a, a actress Adele James portrays a melanated uh, Cleopatra. And it has uh, a lot of people upset. And then you have one attorney in Egypt who said he's going to sue Netflix uh, because they are showing an inaccurate representation of uh, Cleopatra. All right. So there's a good article from Variety.com that deals with this. And this is this article is written by uh, Tina Garabi, who is the director of this segment. Uh, this installment of the African Queens docudrama series. So the name of this article is Queen uh, Cleopatra, director speaks out. What bothers you so much about a black Cleopatra? What bothers you so much about a black Cleopatra? And she said, and other scholars, and I talked to Dr. Charles Finch today and Google his name, Dr. Charles Finch. We're going to get him on the show. I, I talked to him. We're setting up an interview to, to talk about Cleopatra and some other things. He has a book coming out, another book coming out as well. It is more likely that Cleopatra looked like our actor than Elizabeth Taylor ever did. Than Elizabeth Taylor ever did. Okay, so um, 
Tina Garavi uh, says that last summer I was uh, living in, in Venice Beach and had decided uh, due to a friend's persistence to visit a fortune teller. Me, ever the skeptic, uh, put game of uh, 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 me, ever the skeptic, but game for a laugh, agreed to go along, agreed to go along. What the fortune teller said to me, uh, said made me roll my eyes. Quote, I am not saying you are Cleopatra, but somehow you share her story and are connected. This is what the fortune teller uh, told her. I'm not saying you are Cleopatra, but somehow uh, you share her story and are connected. Okay, so less than a month later, she said, I got a call from a production company making Jada Pinkett Smith's uh, African Queens and was subsequently hired to direct four episodes of a drama documentary on the life of the controversial leader. The joke was on me. The joke was on me. She said, I remember as a kid seeing Elizabeth Taylor play Cleopatra. And I, I remember when I was younger seeing that movie and uh it was cleopatra and uh, uh mark anthony and you know seeing the, the the ancient egyptians portrayed as europeans and things of this nature okay same thing they did with the ten commandments you got yul brenner playing uh, uh ramses uh remetsu mariam and uh ramses and you have uh um the uh, i forgot so she played uh, nefertari these white these white imposters uh, portraying African people. Same, same, same game that Hollywood ran uh, on us then. You know, they, they continue to run it like when the gods of Egypt came out and they showed the uh, Netaru and rulers of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt as Europeans. I think if I remember correctly, they showed some of the uh, um, what they would call slaves as African people, but they showed the rulers of ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt as Europeans. Um, it, it reminds me of a I was on, um, um, I, I just saw an interview that Chuck D did with Drink Champs. And some of you all that saw Roland Martin Unfiltered two weeks ago, we had Chuck D on the show. So I got the talk, a chance to ch uh, talk to uh, Chuck D from Public Enemy. You know, we've had um, Professor Griff here on the African History Network show a few times over the past few years. Uh, over the past 13 years, we've been doing this show. But Public Enemy had a song with Ice Cube called Burn Hollywood Burn. And, and that's what um, Chuck D was talking about in the, inter, in, the, in the interview with Drink Champ, Burn Hollywood Burn. So when I see these uh, images coming out uh, that uh, the me that try to erase, especially ancient African history, that that song plays in my mind, Burn Hollywood Burn by uh, Public Enemy with Ice Cube. But uh, Tina Garabi said, uh, I was captivated, but even then, I felt the image was not right when she saw Elizabeth Taylor playing Cleopatra. She said, was her skin really that white? With this new production, could I find the answers about Cleopatra's heritage and release her from the stranglehold that Hollywood placed on her image? Release her from the stranglehold that Hollywood placed on her image. Born in Iran, I am a Persian and Cleopatra's heritage has been attributed at one time or another to the Greeks, the Macedonians and the Persians. Uh, the known factors are that her Macedonian Greek uh, uh, family, the Ptolemaic lineage, P-T-O-L-E-M-A-I-C, Ptolemaic line lineage, intermarried with West Asians uh, Seleucid dynasty, S-E-L-U-C-I-D dynasty, and had been in Egypt for 300 years. Cleopatra was eight generations away from these uh, Ptolemaic ancestors, making the chance of her being white somewhat unlikely. What Now, one of the things that uh, I talked about on Roland Martin Unfiltered is that the prism that we're looking through, um, the, the prism that we're trying to look at this ancient history in, in terms of black and white, 
those are relatively new concepts, largely being shaped in the 17th and 18th centuries. Um, so, Doug, here, let's do this. We're going to uh, clip number one. This is from Roland Martin Unfiltered from April 21st, 2023. Erica Savage is sitting there for Roland Martin. Let's go to the clip, uh, Doug. A backlash is brewing over a new Netflix film by Egyptian-British filmmaker Tina Gavari. The TV drama documentary series about the life of Cleopatra, featuring Black actress Adele James in the leading role, has sparked outrage in Egypt with accusations of blackwashing and stealing their history. While it is unclear whether Cleopatra was Black, Gavari feels it is unlikely she was white. Huh. As history suggests, Elizabeth Taylor played the queen in 1963. Gavari calls for a conversation about colorism and internalized white supremacy and for imaginations to be liberated so historical figures can be explored without fear. Queen Cleopatra debuts on Netflix May 10th. So, Michael, with the social media controversy uh, that has uh, brewed, that was the first thing that I thought about. One of the early depiction, depictions that I saw of Queen P Cle Cleopatra um, was by Elizabeth Taylor, who is no doubt non-Black and very white. Uh, talk to me a little bit about um, what lens you believe that this is really kind of um, gaining a lot of momentum from and what this does when, with, you know, kind of like this racial reckoning that was supposed to happen after um, the uh, lynching of George Floyd, what does it say about really where people hold um, their racial sentiments? Okay, well, well, thanks for asking that question, Erica. And um, I had been following this story for a number of reasons. And uh, today I reached out to one of my teachers, Professor Jane Small, about this, who was a consultant on the first installment of the African Queens uh, series, mm -hmm. uh, executive produced by Jada Pinkett Smith. The first installment was on Queen Nzinga of uh, Matamba, which is in modern-day Angola. He was a consultant on that first installment. Uh, and Professor Small put me in contact with one of my friends, Tony Browder, author of Nine Valley Contributions to Civilization. So this is uh, a complicated issue. The reason why is, in, in looking at different articles on this, um, the framework of black and white are our contemporary framework, 17th century, 18th century, coming from people like Carl von Linnaeus uh, and uh, Dr. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, who are um, credited with really stratifying humanity into races. Okay, we're gonna pick this up on the other side of the break. Hey, Doug, next week we gotta get this Imhotep guy on the show, man. I like him, man. That guy's always sharp. He's a sharp dresser, too. All right, you listen to the African History Network show on Michael Imhotep. We'll be back in a few minutes. 313 778 7600 is the call in number. If you have a question or comment, listen to 9 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF. We'll be back in a few minutes. If great programming it is what you want, 9 10 a.m. is what you need. I'm your host, Brother Michael and Hotel. On the After History Network show, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent who are the diaspora and around the world. A lot of people don't know what the hell they're talking about. They may have that area of expertise, but some people need to learn how to stay in their own lane. If you don't know, just say you don't know. Oh, we have a lot to talk about, so we're going to jump right into this. Catch it all right here on 9 10 a.m. Superstition. Welcome back to the African History Network show. All right, they have some new imaging for my show. Okay, <laughs> I didn't know they're gonna pull that one. But anyway, all right, they have some new clips on my show. Okay, so um, right before the break, we were I was sharing a segment from Roland Martin Unfiltered from uh, Friday, April 21st, when we were talking about the uh, controversy dealing with Queen, Queen Cleopatra and her depiction, et cetera. Uh, we're going to go back to that uh, clip here. Just a second. Let me go over to this. Okay, uh, Doug, let's go back to the clip, please. So this is uh, a complicated issue. The reason why is, in, in looking at different articles on this, um, the framework of black and white 
our, our contemporary framework, 17th century, 18th century, coming from people like Carl von Linnaeus uh, and uh, Dr. Johann Friedrich Blumenbach, who are um, credited with really stratifying humanity into races. Okay, in antiquity, we don't we don't have that type of construct. So we're trying to look at something in ancient times. Uh, uh, Cleopatra the seventh was born in uh, 69 B.C. in Alexandria, Egypt. Uh, we're trying to look at something in antiquity in BC times through the through, through a contemporary lens. Uh, the, the question is when it comes to her mother and grandmother and their what we would call ethnicity. It's 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 unclear uh, on the father's side. So she's in the um, uh, line of what known what are known as the Ptolemies. The Ptolemy uh, the Ptolemy line comes in uh, after Alexander the Greek, because ain't nothing great about him, after Alexander the Greek invades Egypt in 332 B.C., and then uh, uh, Ptolemy the I Sotelagi takes over uh, in 323 B.C., and these are Greeks, okay? So uh, it, it, she is looked at as possibly, possibly being Egyptian, African, partially on her mother or grandmother's side. It's not conclusive. However, I think it was, um, I like the depiction. So, so, so the, this installment comes out May 10th, okay? So I've just seen the trailer. I like the depiction coming from uh, this series dealing with African queens. Now, the backlash coming from uh, Egyptians, uh, and we got to be careful of, of that term Egyptian because we're dealing with uh, Egypt basically after it was conquered by Arabs, and the Arabs invade in 639 A.D. and conquer in 642 A.D. So we have to really be careful of what we're talking about. This is not what we call ancient Kemet, which was ruled by what we would term as black Africans who are, who are relatives of the Nubians, okay? So uh, you have a effort to whitewash, uh, so to speak, whitewash uh, Egypt and the history of it and to discredit uh, the indigenous African people when it comes to the pyramids, when it comes to the greatness of, of uh, ancient Kemen, and ancient Egypt. So uh, I think there should be debates on this. I think there should be uh, uh, historical presentations on this. This can be the catalyst coming from uh, Jada Pinkett Smith and uh, and Will Smith's uh, production company. This can be the catalyst for this, but we need to get some um, African scholars uh, in on this, people like Tony Browder, uh, people like uh, Sister Nubia Wartford, who's a cultural anthropologist here in Detroit, who I've interviewed a number of times. Uh, and at the same time, we also have to refute uh, the tour that Dr. Zahi Hawass is uh, going on starting in, in May uh, around uh, the U.S. And that appears to be an attempt also to whitewash uh, ancient Egypt as well. There's always an attempt to either separate Egypt from Africa or say that the Egyptians, the ancient Egyptians, were either brown-skinned Caucasians or anything but sub-Saharan sub Africans. So th this is something that we really have to uh, analyze and fight against. Yeah, Michael, and thank you for bringing out those points. No doubt it's definitely complex. We know that they're white Arabs. Um, they're people, you know, of Arab descent that are um, of different you know, background. Well, they're black Arabs And also. so, absolutely. So we, we understand that. And so, um, Joe, want to um, bring this to you. You know, the claims of blackwashing when there are movies that, you know, I can think of like Gods of Egypt where white men played Egyptians. Um, I'm thinking about The Last Samurai with um, Tom Cruise. He <laughs> is a whole white man. Um, so talk to me a little bit about, you know, to um, essentially make the claim um, of uh, blackwashing, um, which I did not know was a whole word, but I guess it is a whole word. Um, talk to me a little bit about what does it mean for other depictions of, in Hollywood that we've seen when we look at the background of what is actually being brought to film and the background does not match um, the Percy that, person that's embodying that particular role. The shoe is on the other foot now, right? <clears throat> this lends to the larger narrative and the larger fear about being outnumbered, about being 
majority minority where the rest of the world is. I mean, if they're concerned about black, blackwashing right now, uh, well, listen, they should be much more understanding about what we've been dealing with mm. for a long, long time, mm. whether it's inventions, whether it's uh, you know, uh, historical context for things that happened in Africa, uh, creating the pyramids. You know, uh, we can go a long way and have a long conversation about things that have been misconstrued and directly actually lied about because one of the things that happen, happens, frankly, is that when you're in charge, you decide. I mean, mm. you know, I was, I was getting ready to say H-E-L-L, the word, but I was getting ready to say Jesus after the word. I'm getting ready to say, heck, Jesus is historically inaccurate on the board. They even took the Son of God. Come on. And flipped that. Come on. And so at the end of the day, you know, what happens is when you want something, you want it to be yours, you change it to look like you, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But if we want to be truthful, then let's do, you know, what we're talking about here in right. terms of let's uh, get the information to be historically accurate to the extent that we can, and then embrace it. You don't have to feel any worse about anything just because we started civilization, but it is what it is, okay? So let's just go down the road, be truthful, you know, and 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 get rid of this notion about, you know, being commercial, you know, whitewashing things, making things feel better, you know, uh, making things look better and feel better uh, when you're really just turning it on its head and flipping what you've been doing the whole time. Absolutely could not agree more. And uh, Matt, you know, to bring in the last point uh, that Joe just made in terms of the truthfulness piece, uh, you know, when you think about the depictions of Jesus, you know, he pretty much has um, a, a perm and uh, is, you know, you know, white. Um, essentially, when you know is described as something very, very different um, in the Holy Script. But we're, we've been really dealing in a lot of elements of truth not being brought to certain communities, right? So when we're talking about, whether it's talking about Proposition A, um, remedies that will be made for black and brown communities that will be of good effect for them, whether we're talking about, um, uh, you know, environmental um, impact for black and brown communities, truths that really do matter in terms of ensuring that black, brown, and indigenous communities are protected. Um, very quickly before we go to break, can you just share a little bit about what it would mean if this film is essentially not allowed to move forward on May 10th with the depiction of Queen Cleopatra um, as a black, as a brown woman? I think that's a, another brilliant, insightful question. And to answer it very succinctly, I think it's just kind of part and parcel with the reality that we're seeing that the truth does not matter, it's the mm. feelings that matter. So people are taking umbrage to the idea that the depiction that they have been you know, sold for all these years about Cleopatra is being attacked, not the actual you know, reality of who she may have been, to Michael's point, about not knowing the, the heritage of her mother. And what we're seeing particularly as it relates to the fights in the state houses and as it relates to education and all of the things in the national zeitgeist right now is that the truth doesn't matter. What matters mm -hmm. is how you feel about what's being discussed, case in point, critical race theory. 1% of people have any idea what that actually means. Mm -hmm. What they hear is race, so the truth of what's being taught or not being taught right. is immaterial. It's how people feel about that buzzword race, right? So that's what we're dealing with, and if you extrapolate from that, I think if this doesn't go forward, mm -hmm. then it shows that you know people who are uh, don't care about the truth, but who care more about how they feel about a potential truth, um, have a louder bullhorn. And that becomes a problem because if we do not have a consistency and a demand for the truth at all time, mm. then we have no idea what is true and what is false. And when you wade into those waters, it's easy to control the people, which is what we're seeing happening uh, in our country. My, my, a word was preached by Michael, Matt, <laughs> and Joe. Okay. Uh, so you can check out th th that uh, show in its entirety. That was from April 21st, 2023 on Roland Martin Unfiltered. Follow Roland on uh, YouTube. Uh, download the Black Star Media app. Follow uh, me on YouTube. I face 64,000 followers on YouTube. It should be at at least 100,000 because I have a million followers on, on Facebook. So it should be at, at at least 100,000 on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. All right, now... Calling numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call-in number if you have a question or comment. 
Um, I want to go back to this article. This is an important article from Variety.com. Then we're going to look at some more historical information. And I also want, also want you to hear the conversation I had with Tony Browder today. Uh, and we dealt with a, a, a number of different topics. Mo most of the conversation was not about Cleopatra. It was about uh, putting all this history into um, context. Uh, dealing with now dealing with the Nile Valley region of Africa and Nile Valley history. But if we uh, go back to this article from Variety.com written by Tina Garavi, who is the director of uh, this installment of African Queens series dealing with Cleopatra. So she said Cleopatra was eight generations away from these uh, Ptolemaic ancestors, making the chance of her being white somewhat unlikely after 300 years, uh, surely we can uh, safely say Cleopatra was Egyptian. Now, she was no more Greek or Macedonian than Rita Wilson or Jennifer Aniston. Both are one generation from Greece. Now, uh, in talking to uh, Dr. Charles Finch today, he said that um, she would probably more like the complexion of a Dorothy Dandridge. OK, which now that could be why they wanted Dorothy Dan Dandridge, Dorothy Dandridge at one point to play Cleopatra instead of uh, Elizabeth Taylor when they were looking at casting for that 1963 movie. Now, uh, Tina Garavi, director Tina Garavi goes on to say, doing the research, doing the research, I realized what a political act it would be to see Cleopatra portrayed by a black actress. For me, the idea that people had gotten it so incredibly wrong historically from uh, Theta Barra to uh, Monica Bellucci and recently with Angelina Jolie and Gal Gadot uh, in the running to play her, to play Queen, uh, Queen Cleopatra, meant we had to get it even more right, meant we had to get it even more right. The hunt was on to find the right performer to bring Cleopatra into the 21st century. Now, here's a picture of uh, director Tina Garabi. And she went on to say, why shouldn't Cleopatra be a melanated sister? And why do some people need Cleopatra to be white? Why do some people need Cleopatra to be white? Her proximity to whiteness seems to give her value. And for some Egyptians, it seems to really matter. Her proximity to whiteness seems to give her value. And for some Egyptians, not all of them, but for some Egyptians, and it may be just a small uh, uh, minority of Egyptians, it seems to really matter. After much hand, uh, hand wringing, and countless auditions, we found Adele James, Adele James, an actor, an actress, who could convey not only Cleopatra's beauty, but also her strength. Not only her beauty, but also her strength. And the, the trailer for this is, is fantastic so far. It's just it's a two-minute trailer, and it looks really, really good. Uh, what the historians can confirm is that it is more likely that Cleopatra uh, looked like Adele, Adele James, than Elizabeth Taylor ever did. Okay. So, and you know, this is, I, I talked to Tony today about, um, we had a telephone conversation before we did the uh, interview. And I was explaining to him, I said, you know, I, I see the same thing with these Disney movies that have the black princess but she ain't married to a black man or an African man. So let me just, we're coming up on a break. Let me just go and dissect the princess and the frog. Okay. Uh, whatever you do, don't ever let your black children, don't ever let your African American children see this movie from Disney called the princess and the frog. Now, when I first heard that they were coming out with a movie about a black princess from Walt Disney and Walt Disney does have a history of racism. OK. And I was like, uh oh, what is this about? OK. Now, if you have the uh, Tiana, Princess Tiana dial, OK, that's fine. 
you, you, you let your children play with the Princess Tiana doll, that's fine. Don't get Prince Naveen, okay? Just let her play with the uh, 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 Princess Tiana doll and have her and have Princess Tiana marry T'Challa from Black Panther, okay? When they play with the dolls. Um, we're going to continue this on the other side of the break. It's important that we go through and dissect this, especially with somebody like me who's a historian, but also has a background in marketing and the foundation of marketing and psychology. Because uh, TV uh, movies like this, cartoons like this targeting our children, a lot of it is propaganda. And if we don't understand how they are attacking our children, attacking our, our psyche, we won't be able to fight back. Listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation. Uh, call in numbers 313-778-7600. 313-778-7600 is the call in number uh, if you have a question or comment. All right. And uh, Doug, I'm going to send you this uh, clip here. It's just queued up. It's for clip number two. Um, it's I just have it uh, queued up at the right point. All right. So I'm going to send this to you here. OK, uh, so let's continue. Um, I just sent that to you. All right. So the princes and the frog. I, I want to talk about this for a quick minute and then we'll get back to um, Cleopatra. But this is all connected. This deals with the power of imagery. Right. And in my lecture series dealing with the um, deliberate destruction of the African-American family, uh, I, I talk about the princes and the frog. So. And I'm going to pull up a picture here uh, as well as of this, because I can't remember which uh, um, where the presentation is on uh, PowerPoint. I have, I have so many presentations that I've done, and um, I, don't, I don't even remember which laptop I had back at that time when I did this. But uh, many people have seen the uh, movie The Princess and the Frog. Uh, which is from Walt Disney. Okay. Now the uh, movie takes place in New Orleans. Okay. During the jazz era. Okay. New Orleans, twenties, thirties, forties, something like that. And you have uh, Tiana, who's an African-American woman. Okay. Uh, and she, let me see. Hold on. You have Tiana, who's an African-American woman. And uh, in the movie, at the beginning of the movie, her father dies. Now, the voice of her father is uh, from Terrence Howard, okay? Uh, from Ter Terrence Howard, actor uh, Terrence Howard. So she um, wants to own some type of nightclub or something like that. Uh, she can't find any uh, uh, other African-American man to help her with her dreams, okay? Help her fulfill her dreams. Uh, she is going to end up falling in love with this uh, Eurasian-looking prince named Prince Naveen, okay? And the only other, the only other uh, figure male figure of African descent is the voodoo priest. Okay. The voodoo priest and the voodoo priest is evil. Okay. So pay attention to this. Instead of the African man, the voodoo priest, instead of him being a protector of princess Tiana, he's her adversary. And he's evil. Her savior is Prince Naveen, who is this Arab Eurasian looking guy. But it gets even deeper than this because the, the movie takes place, the cartoon takes place in New Orleans. New Orleans is in Louisiana. Louisiana becomes part of the United States through what's known as the Louisiana Purchase of 1803. 
in the Louisiana Purchase of 1803, the U.S. gets 828,000 square miles of land for about three cents an acre from, from where? From France. From France. This is Napoleon Bonaparte, who just five years later, five years prior to 1803 and 1798, Napoleon conquers Egypt. What's going on in the world at this time in 1803? What's going on in the world at this time in 1798? France is fighting against a group of Africans in a colony called Saint Dominique, who the Africans are going to call Haiti and later Haiti. Saint Dominique is on the island of La Isla. La Isla Española, which is what Christopher Columbus called the island when he conquered it in, in 1492. And the western third of the island was first the colony of Santo Domingo under the Spanish. Then in 1697, the French take over the, the western third. They take over that uh, western third of the island from the Spanish and they call it Saint Dominique. When you study the Haitian Revolution, which begins in 1791, the Haitians reclaimed African spirituality and cast aside their white God, as uh, one of my teachers, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, talks about in the documentary 1804 from Director Tariq, uh, Director Tariq Nasheed. They cast aside their white God. They reclaimed African spirituality. What was the African spirituality that these Africans reclaimed that to help them defeat the French? And they didn't just beat the French, they beat the Spanish and the British because the Spanish and the British were allies of the French. They reclaimed Vodun, who Europeans derisively call voodoo. And we see the African man, the only other African-American male character in the movie, The Princess and the Frog, he's the voodoo priest, so he's automatically evil. So what they are doing is also attacking the African spirituality, which the Haitians reclaimed to help them defeat these European colonizers. This is in the movie, The Princess and the Frog. Whatever you do, don't let your children watch this movie. If they're, if they're, Don't let your children watch this movie, especially if they're of African descent. So then she finds her savior in this white looking Eurasian Arab looking prince, Prince Naveen. And they go off and they, they turn into frogs. They live happily ever after. She doesn't live happily ever after with an African-American man that looks like her father who died early in the movie. He was an older man. Yeah, he died early in the movie. He could not protect her. She found, now I'm not saying Prince Naveen was a bad guy. I'm not saying that. Okay, don't, I'm not saying he was a bad guy but he wasn't a black guy. That's what I'm saying. So we have to understand the programming behind a lot of these movies. And when we look at uh, Brandy playing Cinderella and she ends up with a non-African prince or non-African king, not an attack on Brandy, but it's like you, you have to go through and, and say, well, wait a second. You keep having these uh, uh, African princesses and black princesses, Walt Disney, but you don't have a black prince. You don't have a black king. Is Disney afraid of showing African men in positions of power, ruling over nations, controlling natural resources, having wealth? You listen to the African History Network show. When we come back, we're going to go back to Cleopatra, Queen Cleopatra the Seventh. Talk some more about the uh, series from Jada Pinkett Smith. And then I'm going to let you hear my discussion with Tony Browder on the subject today as well. He's the author of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. This is the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation. All right. The calling number is 313-778-7600, 313 313-778-7600 is the call in number if you have a question or comment. All right, uh, I wanna go back to uh, this article here. Uh, this is from variety.com and this deals with um, the Queen Cleopatra uh, documentary from 
uh, Jada Pinkett Smith in the African Queens series. So this is a good article from Variety.com written by Tina Garavi, who is the director of um, this installment of the uh, documentary series. And this is on Netflix. OK, so the first installment dealt with Queen and Zynga. And the uh, second installment deals with um, Queen Cleopatra the seventh. So if we go back to uh, this article here, it says uh, what historians can confirm is that it is more likely that Cleopatra looked like Adele, Adele James, the uh, actress who portrays uh, Queen Cleopatra, from what I from what I see so far, she's done a good job. I've only seen the two minute trailer, but it looks really, really interesting. Um, she looks more like Adele James than uh, Elizabeth Taylor. OK, now, as production got nearer. I realized the magnitude and political nature of this job. It was important to get things right, but also to find a way of telling the story with humanism and nuance, with humanism and nuance. The last thing we needed was another Cleopatra divorced from her womanhood and her power only sexualized, divorced from her womanhood and her power only sexualized. Uh, when, and when I talked to Tony Browder today, he brought up Megan Thee Stallion and I talked about Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B and the song WAP and the hypersexualization of African-American women and how. Uh, so it was Atlantic Records that financed that song in the video. And you, you you're not going to have a uh, a record company put have a top white female artist put out such hyper sexualized lyrics they're not going to do this because you only protect what you respect and they even though they uh do suppress white women even though uh, some of them do have archaic uh views on women's rights things like this at the same time they're going to treat them better than they treat african american women because you only protect what you respect and they realize if you uh, show white women as being hypersexualized like that, then what that then um, the way you uh, portray a people influences how you treat a people. The, 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 your thoughts create feelings, your feelings create actions and behaviors, your actions and behaviors create results. The, um, what you know about a people influences how you see a people, influences how you treat a people. So if they put out uh, images of white women that shows them hypersexualized and and using explicit lyrics like that, and they are uh, they have a music video out, and the uh, chorus of the song repeats the phrase "There's some H's in this house" about seventy nine times. White people are not going to tolerate that. The, all, all the white feminist organizations will come out in opposition to that. Largely, none of them came out in opposition to what because it was Negroes doing it. All the white, all the white feminist organizations, the white reproductive right organization, all of them will come out in opposition to this. And, and Atlantic Records and other record companies know this. But Negroes will tolerate anything. See, Neg Negroes will tolerate anything so they know they can do it and get away with it. And then it wins what song of the year at the at the at the American Music Award. And I think it won like Grammy it's a song of the year for the Grammys or something like that. If your song of the year is WAP, you are having a terrible year. I'm trying to tell you right now, if your song of the year is what go look at it, go look at the explicit. Go look, go read the uncensored lyrics. If you if your song of the year is WAP, you are having a horrible year. Now, the majority of my criticism, and, and many of you all have seen the interviews that the uh, the, the uh, pound discussion I did with African American women on this. We had Herb Alchemist on. We had uh, Jade Arendelle. We had uh, hip hop artist Heck of a Mecca, um, and it was, so I had had three women on. Yeah, um, majority of my criticism is not against Megan Thee Stallion and Cardi B, they're being used. 
it's against white corporations like Atlantic Records because they know better. And the reason why they know better is because they're not going to do that with a white female artist. And then the, when you look at the video, the only all the women in the video are, are, are of African descent, except for Kylie Jenner. Now, Kylie Jenner is a white billionaire. She's part of the uh, Kardashian family. She's from the Bruce Jenner side. Now, nah, Caitlyn, we ain't going to go into that conversation. But she's part of that side of the family. OK, Jenner, nothing against her. You had some white people who who did a online petition because they wanted her digitally digitally removed from the video because she's a white female billionaire and they didn't feel she belonged in the video basically now see once again you only protect what you respect they were basically saying look you too good to be with these negroes let the that, let those negroes do that we don't have a problem if they do that that's what we expect of them that's what history tells us about them. That's what the media tells us about them. They're hypersexualized. They have to be over-policed. They're criminals. We expect that from them. The, 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 the chorus of the song repeat, repeats the phrase, there's some H's in this house about 79 times. Those Negroes can do that. That's fine. White woman, you have no business being with them. We're going to rescue you because you only protect what you respect. And then many of us just sit up there so brain damaged that we tolerate nonsense like this. And at some point, we have to come to the conclusion that the best way for us to get people to stop treating us like N-words is stop acting like it. What, the, 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 what happens when you have real life caricatures real life examples of the various of the, of the same stereotypes that you're protesting against at some point we got to decide well hold on wait a second now look uh, we we're gonna have to figure this out now we can't have real life examples of the same stereotypes that we are trying to hold them accountable for for portraying us as we're gonna have to make up our minds on this because people who understand their history are much more guarded about the images they allow other people to project of them. They don't tolerate stuff like that. Okay. Um, let me go back to this article here. Because this we only have two hours on the show. This ain't on my regular platform. I can do whatever I want to do. We only have two hours here and we have commercial breaks every 15 minutes. Okay, so the HBO series... Rome, R-O-M-E, portrayed one of the most intelligent, sophisticated, and powerful women in the world as a sleazy, dissipated drug addict, yet Egypt did not seem to mind. Yet Egypt did not seem to mind. Where was the outrage then? But portraying her as black, well, this is what Tina Garavi asked. Now, perhaps it's not just that I've directed a series that portrays Cleopatra as black, but I have asked Egyptians to see themselves as Africans, but that I have asked Egyptians to see themselves as Africans and they are furious at me for it. I am okay with this. While shooting, while directing, I became the target of a huge online hate campaign. Egyptians accused me of blackwashing and stealing their history. Egyptians, ain't that the pot calling the kettle black? I mean, it's, come on. It, so at some point, we're going to have to have a reckoning. And it's like, hold on, wait a second. It's like, it's like in this country, when you have white people uh, uh, who like have, a, who take offense to Native Americans wanting to get their treaties enforced. Or it's like, it's, it's the same thing when you have, Okay, California, Utah, Nevada, Colorado, uh, uh, California, Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, Utah, Nevada, Texas, all that was belonged to Mexico. Florida was Spanish territory, all that. I, I, I just find it crazy when I hear not all white people do this. Okay, don't call me with no crazy stuff. All white people don't do this. I just find it it's crazy when they when they you had some white Americans want to tell 
other people go back where they came from. Well, hold, you ever study the history of this country? Hold on. The, uh, the people you want to call Mexicans, they were here before you got here. That Not, not only that, when you go and look at President uh, uh, Herbert Hoover, 1929, after the stock market crash, and then it continues with uh, President Franklin Roosevelt, th there was a campaign that where they uh, deported about 1.8 million Mexicans back to Mexico because they said, this was during the Great Depression, they said that these Mexicans were taking jobs away from Americans. Well, wait a second. The Mexican-American War was a territorial dispute where the U.S. instigated this war with Mexico because the U.S. wanted to take over the entire North American continent. And, and, there, and, and, and there were Mexicans here before there were any, uh, or the people who we call Mexicans, the amalgamation of uh, Native Americans, Africans, and then you had the Spanish colonizers. This is where they're coming from. Um, they were here before uh, the first Europeans came here. And yes, African people were here as well. We know going back at least 51,700 years to Khoisan. Dr. David M. Hotep deals with this in the first Americans where Africans documented evidence. Okay, but when I hear uh ancient when I hear people who uh are calling themselves Egyptians today, and they're saying that you're trying to uh blackwash history with however they want to put it, uh Tina Garabi said that while she was directing this this uh series. African Queens dealing with Queen Cleopatra, the second installment. She said, I became the target of a huge online hate campaign. Egyptians accused me of blackwashing and stealing their history. S some threatened to ruin my career, which I wanted to tell them was laughable. I was ruining it, ruining it very well for myself. Thank you very much. No amount of reasoning or reminders that Arab invasions had not yet happened in Cleopatra's age seemed to stem the tide of ridiculous comments. So the Arabs invaded in 639 AD and conquered 642. Cleopatra was born in 69 BC, okay? She was born over uh, uh, approximately 700 years before the Arab invaders. Now, this is after the Assyrians invade in like 6th century BC. We'll continue this uh, other side of the break. I want you to hear part of the conversation I had with Tony Browder today. This is the African History Network show. I'm Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. All right. How's everybody doing? Uh, so we have uh, Keisha. We have Sharon. Uh, Door of Ale. Just a few of the people watching. Sunflower. Fly Girl. Fly Girl said, uh, yes, they are, Michael. They are afraid of all things black. Uh, Sharon said, uh, of course, they are afraid of showing powerful African black men. This was when we were talking about uh, the princess and the frog and uh, Walt Disney. Uh, Sharon said, teach, teach, brother. Um, we've got uh, Fly Girl said, there's no way that Cleopatra could have been anything but a black woman. Well, she, she would have... It's highly possible she she was what we would call biracial today. The her father's side of the family was Greek, or we would say we would say white. Okay. Um, what's unclear is her mother's side of the family and her grandmother. So uh, there's probably some type of African ancestry there on her mother's side of the family. She was, she would probably be what would be considered biracial. She could she could look like uh, Dorothy Dandridge. Dorothy Dandridge be of that complexion. She may be of the complexion maybe of a Halle Berry. Halle Berry is biracial. Halle Berry's mother is white. Um, she may be of the complexion of uh, um, of uh, uh, possibly say an Alicia Keys. Alicia Keys' mother's white. Okay. Alicia Keys is biracial. Okay, so something something of that nature. Okay. 
Okay, Kenneth Kabaka Reynolds uh, said, Hotel Brother and peace to the family. Excellent information as usual, my brother. Kabaka checking in from the Motor City, Detroit. Uh, Shalada, Shalada said, peace, brother Michael. Okay, greetings from London. Uh, Javinci uh, is watching from London, England. Is that London, England or London, Ontario? Probably London, England. We've got Kenya Randall. We've got uh, Michelle. Okay. Brother John Ray. I knew you, brother. Michael Hempel should would educate us. Okay. Keisha. Okay. Uh, we should be clear now, Keisha. I don't know when we're breaking up. I've got Sunflowers watching us also. All right. Be sure to support the African History Network. Dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App through paypal paypal.me forward slash the ahn show back from break in one minute stand by all right welcome back to the african history network show yes i've got the power all right welcome back to the african history network show right here on 9 10 a.m the superstation wfdf can you believe it's been seven years that i've been doing the african history network show on 9 10 a.m the superstation wfdf april April 2023 is seven years, um, and I've been broadcasting in all 13 years, starting March 10th, 2010, on the Harambe Radio Network. You can support the African History Network, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, dollar sign, the AHN show through Cash App, also through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show, and... Um, also visit our website theafricanhistorynetwork.com theafricanhistorynetwork.com you can register for the online history classes that i teach on saturdays and sundays ancient kemet one of the original names for egypt ancient kemet the moors and the ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade we had a great class saturday april 22nd next class saturday april 29th 2 p.m to 4 p.m eastern, St eastern standard time classes on sale 60 dollars regularly 130 dollars we do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. So a year from now, two years from now, you can watch the entire class. On Sundays, I teach black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, uh, the U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, the Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. We had a great class today. Uh, we started, uh, we actually started at four o'clock because uh, we did two hours. Um, the broadcast I did with Tony, um, we did about an hour and I continued for another hour. Uh, so this class looks at history chronologically from 1800 through 1968. We look at what leads up to the civil war taking place. We look at the reconstruction era, Jim Crow era, world war one, world war two, civil rights movement, the black power movement. This information is PG 13. You can use it with your children. We have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes for only a hundred dollars. Okay. That's the, it's a $300 value. All right. Uh, I want to go to this uh, clip here when we spoke with uh, Tony Browder today. All right. We dealt with um, why now Valley. Oh, let me cue this up. We dealt with why uh, Nile Valley uh, history is uh, so important. Okay. Just a second, Doug. And, uh, Tony Browder is the author of Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization, and uh, also uh, Egypt on the Potomac. He's the author of, of that as well, Egypt on the Potomac, and uh, from the Browder Files, okay? And uh, Tony's a, a friend of mine. We've interviewed him here on the African History Network show uh, a number of times. We're also in the documentary series, um, black uh the black friday series together from director rick mathis okay uh black friday and hold on where is that clip okay right here let's see just a second here so we talked about a number of different topics in uh today's interview you can watch this in in its entirety on our facebook fan page the african history network and uh on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. Uh, so the name of this is 
why Nile Valley civilization history matters, why Nile Valley civilization, why Nile Valley civilization uh, uh, history matters. And okay, let me know when you're back, Doug. Uh, he had to step away for a minute. Why, why, why now Valley civilization history matters, uh, African Queens. And at the end of the conversation, we talked about, uh, uh, Queen Cleopatra also Cleopatra the seventh. Uh, I, I'm going to go back to this article here from uh, variety.com. Uh, in the meantime, Uh, if we go back and look at this piece, just a second here, where are we? Um, so Tina Gavari says, no amount of reasoning or reminders that Arab invasions had not yet happened in Cleopatra's age seemed to stem the tide of ridiculous comments. Um, let's see. Amir in his bedroom in Cairo wrote to me to earnestly appeal that Cleopatra was Greek. Oh, 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 Lord, oh, Lord, why would that be a good thing to you, Amir? You're Egyptian. So was Cleopatra black? Was Cleopatra black? We don't know for sure. But we can be certain she wasn't white like Elizabeth Taylor. OK, uh, we need to have a conversation. Um, we need to have a conversation with ourselves about our colorism and the and the internalized white supremacy that Hollywood has indoctrinated us with. The internalized white supremacy that Hollywood has indoctrinated us with. And I, I agree with that, because um, if all white people disappear tomorrow, Negroes will still be Negroes because we're dealing with uh, an, an internalized self-hatred that's been programmed. Now, Willie Lynch never historically existed, so ain't no need to bringing up the fake Willie Lynch letter 1712 that Dr. Kwabina Ashanti wrote in 1970. There's no need in bringing that up. Most of all, we need to realize that Cleopatra's story is less about her than it is about who we are. It's almost as if we don't realize that uh, a misogyny or misogynaire uh, still has an effect on us today. We need to liberate our imaginations and boldly create a world in which we can explore our historical figures without fearing the complexity that comes with their depiction. I am proud to stand with Queen Cleopatra, a, uh, Queen Cleopatra, a reimagined Cleopatra, and with the team that made this. We reimagined a world over 2000 years ago where once there was an exceptional woman who ruled. I would like to draw a direct line from her to the women of Egypt, to, to, to the women in Egypt who rose up in the Arab uprisings and to my Persian, uh, to my Persian sisters who are today rebelling against a brutal regime. Never before has it been more important to have women leaders, white or black. So Queen Cleopatra debuts on Netflix on May 10th. Okay, so check that out. And uh, you can read this article in its entirety from Variety.com. Queen Cleopatra, director speaks out, what bothers you so much about a black Cleopatra? What bothers you so much about a black Cleopatra? Do we do we have the clip queued up? This is this is clip number. Understand that chronology. This is hold um, on just a second. Stop, stop the clip. And back back it up to the uh, was it forty one twenty one mark? Whatever mark I said. I was asking was it ready? I wasn't saying play it. Uh, okay, so so this is the. Here's the excerpt of my interview with uh, Tony Browder from earlier today. Let's go to the clip, please. And that is 
the major reason why people of African ancestry are still here. The reason why we have not been exterminated is because of the power that we carry within yes. us, this genetic memory that has been driving us and allowing certain people within our group to overcome seemingly insurmountable odds. So it's not just us doing this, it's the ancestors working through us. And it's the acknowledgement of the ancestors, which has always been our greatest yes. power, our greatest resource. So whatever others can do to make you feel that to be African is to be ignorant, to be African is to be shameful. Deny your African ancestry means that you deny your ancestors, which means you cut yourself off from your only salvation, mm -hmm. right? So, so there, and unfortunately, brother, there are many of us, many of our people who deny that they're African. Correct. Who deny that African people have ever done anything of any significance, who have bought into the narrative, bought into the lie. Those people will be marginalized by their unwillingness to embrace a larger historical truth. And that's, that's on them. Right. Not everybody is going to get it. Not everybody is capable of understanding what is at play. And that uh, are those people who have always been in opposition to the restoration of, of the African mind, the restoration of African consciousness, will always fund those people who will undermine this effort. That has always been the case. That's part of what COINTELPRO mm -hmm. is Count about. Counting program, yeah. yes. Yes, and, and, and also the use of government infiltrators to undermine organizations that were working on behalf of uh, the advancement of African people. The Black Panther Party mm -hmm. was infiltrated mm -hmm. yes. by, by, by these people. Anyone who saw Judas and the Black Messiah, mm -hmm. right, saw that. And, and that story hit home to me because I'm from the west side of Chicago. Okay. You know, I know about Fred Hampton and Mark Clark. I was a freshman in college when Fred Hampton and Mark Clark were murdered. Right. Uh, went to school with a young lady who was in the house the night of the murder. So to have her give her description of what happened and then to read in the newspaper, the Chicago Sun-Times, or to watch on the news, Mayor Daley, Edward Hammerhand, and other government officials give their version of the story, that's when uh, the covers came off for me. That's when I began to realize that the media lies, yes. the politicians lies, that people have a vested interest in perpetuating a false narrative in order to maintain their power and suppress any effort on the part of African people to free their yes. minds. So these issues, these issues are critical, man. And we cannot, you know, we, we cannot have a short term memory Correct. when we're dealing mm -hmm. with long term issues. Look at what happened in the 60s. Look at the rise of the black power movement, the black consciousness movement and the things that the government did to shut that down, the introduction of drugs into our community. Again, I'm from the west side of Chicago, so I can tell you specifically uh, what happened when cocaine was allowed to come into the community unabated. Yes. What the film, and this is again the power of the media, what the film um, uh, Superfly did to destroy conscious black folk on the west side of right. Chicago. Right, the original Superfly with Ron O'Neill, the original Superfly. Yes, exactly. yeah. Exactly, so I, I was in Chicago, man, when that film yep. came out. And I saw how when the black exploitation movies, yeah, and, and very, very so, quickly, and, and I know we only have a few minutes left here because I know you got to run. Uh, a, a couple of things I, I want to hit on that, but uh, very quickly because uh, people are asking. Uh, also, if you want to support the African History Network, you could do so. Uh, cash app dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App or through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. We have the links on our website, the African History Network.com, the African History Network.com. I put the links there because some people have set up fake African History Network Cash App accounts and they've been mm -hmm. stealing money from us. Okay. Yeah. But we have the yeah. actual links there. You can click on it. Uh for to support Tony Browder and the work that he and his daughter Atlantis Browder do. Okay. Go to IKG hyphen info info.com ikg hyphen or dash info.com uh you mentioned uh uh superfly and, and uh, i want to uh talk about that for just a quick minute and then have you connect now valley civilization and history to queen cleopatra put it in a historical correct context okay we're not gonna let that dominate the conversation uh nathan mccall the author Nathan McCall, uh, he had a book out in the 1990s called Makes Me Want to Holler. African-American Man Makes Me Want to Holler. And I read his book and he talked about how in the 70s, the movie Superfly made he and his uh, uh, friends 
want to sell drugs, to live that type of lifestyle, okay? Um, and he ended up going to prison. He became a journalist. I think it was either the Washington, I think it was the Washington Post he ended up writing for. Washington, Washington Post. Post. Yeah, I read his book. Yeah. And his, his book was fantastic. And I, and I had the book on tape. But that deals with the power of the media. OK. And Dr. Mm -hmm. Leonard Jeffries ha has talked about previously how those black exploitation movies, not all of them. There, bit, some, there were some right. good movies, but how mm -hmm. some of those movies showed us in the worst light and promoted drug usage, pimping, exactly. selling drugs, <laughs> things of this nature. And white people profited off of these degrading images of African-Americans. Right after Dr. King's assassinated in 1968, mm -hmm. Malcolm X assassinated in 65, the Black Panther Party for Self-Defense is infiltrated and largely derailed, okay? And mm -hmm. then you have these movies. So we got to understand that chronology. Um, connect the Nile Valley civilization history to putting Queen Cleopatra VII in the correct historical context, please. Great. So... The, the, the perfect example I can give you is the work of Dr. Asa G. Hill, okay. III, who established a framework for understanding Nile Valley civilization. And he divided Nile Valley civilization into four golden okay. ages. The first golden age was uh, dynasties three through six, when all of the mayor or pyramids were constructed. The second golden age was dynasties 11 and 12, uh, 11 to 12, when all of the great literature, the philosophical literature, the scientific literature, the moral literature for, for the nation was established during that period of time. The third golden age and the longest golden age is dynasties 18 and 19, okay. when Kemet was forced to become an imperialistic nation because of continued intrusions from mm -hmm. the north. Uh, and then you have the last golden age, the fourth and final golden age, which is the 25th dynasty, which is what Dr. John Henry Clark referred to as Africa's last great walk in the sun. It was the last time in history that Africans were the wealthiest and, and most powerful people on the planet. Right. So if you understand that framework, then um, after the, the 25th dynasty, and they, there were 30 dynasties in, in, in the history of dynastic Egypt, Kemet civilization fell in 332 BC with the advent of Alexander Macedonia, conquering Kemet and turning Kemet into right. Egypt. Egypt is a Greek, Greek word. Pyramid is Egypt Greek. is a Greek this word. Is Greek. So most of the names of African places and things and people have been changed by non-African people. So if you don't know the original names, you'll never be able to understand the history, the culture, uh, the science, the philosophy, and the concepts as they were originally uh, created. Give you. Let me give you one okay. example of that. Pyramid is a Greek word, which means little flat cake, like a mm -hmm. pancake. The original word for that structure is mir, M-I-R. Right. And the word mir means the place of ascension. Uh, so mir, uh, there, there are no bodies buried in any pyramids of mir in, in the entire Nile Valley, none, zero. So anytime anybody tells you that the pyramids were tombs, that is a lie. All right, pause, pause it right there. We're gonna pick this up on the other side of the break. Uh, that was, Part of my interview that I did earlier today with Tony Browder. It's been a busy, busy weekend. Um, you listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Welcome back to the African History Network show right here on 9, 10 a.m. The Superstation. Okay. Um, let's, do, uh, let's do this. I want to go back to the clip here from... Um, the interview that I did with Tony Browder today. Uh, we're going to pick this up at the uh, 42 minute mark, Doug. Uh, let's go back to this clip, please. Be able to understand the history, the culture, uh, the science, the philosophy, and the concepts as they were originally uh, created. Give you, let me give you one okay. example of that. Pyramid is a Greek word, which means little flat cake, like a pancake. Mm -hmm. The original word for that structure is mir, M I R. Right. And the word mir means the place of ascension. Uh, so mir, uh, there, there are no bodies buried in any pyramids of mir in, in the entire Nile Valley, none, zero. So anytime anybody tells you that the pyramids were tombs, that is a lie. It's an, an intentional lie or unintentional lie based on ignorance. Uh, mir were always built over tombs. The tombs were underground. So the the word mirror means the place of ascension. Mm -hmm. 
the place of ascension. And the purpose of a mirror was to facilitate the ascension of the soul buried underneath it into heaven where that soul would be reborn. And they were very specific about where in heaven a soul would go to be reborn. So the first text which documented this journey of the soul into the afterlife was carved in the burial chamber of a tomb known as the Pyramid of Unas, right? So it's in his burial chamber where you find the oldest written doc, the oldest written religious documents in the world were inscribed on the walls of this particular tomb that talks about the soul, that talks about the process for the salvation of the soul, that talks about the judgment of the soul and the place where souls go to be reborn. So the framework for uh, Western religions can be found in the Nile Valley. So it's important to reclaim the names. It's important to understand chronology and history. So in that context, yes. Alexander Macedonia conquered uh, Kemet in 332 BC, and, and the word Egypt derived from the, the name Haka Batah, which is the temple of the, of the spirit of Batah in the city of Menefer, which was later renamed Memphis by the Greeks. And so that word Hakabata became Ajaptus, which was Latinized and became Egypt. Yes. That's how that word devolved, mm -hmm. not evolved, it devolved because it lost its essence through the, uh, the evolution of the word. And so um, once Alexander conquered Kemet, then he became so enamored by the 3000 years of historical knowledge that he had inherited by virtue of conquest. And so he no longer referred to himself as Alexander, son of Philip of Macedonia. He called himself Alexander, son of Amman, son of Amen, the unseen presence of God right. Almighty, which is a which is a upper Nile Valley concept, right? And so the Greek rulers then descended from Alexander's mm -hmm. line, and Cleopatra mm -hmm. is the last of these Greek rulers. So Cleopatra. For all intents and purposes, Cleopatra was not African. She was not comedic in the literary, in the literal sense of the right. word. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and so my thing is, don't get caught up in Cleopatra. Mm -hmm. There, there mm -hmm. are other personalities of more historical and cultural significance who we should be uh, focusing our attention on. So I would bypass Cleopatra discussion and focus on Queen T, who was one of the baddest queens in human history. Right. She was one of the most powerful rulers on earth. She was the wife of Amenhotep III, and their statue in the uh, Egyptian Museum in Cairo is the largest statue in that building. And anyone who looks upon that statue could see the, the nationality or the race, if you will, of who these two African people were. And it's very clear that we understand the chronology. Um, uh, Queen T was the wife of Amenhotep right. III. Uh, the son was Amenhotep IV, who changed his name to Akhenaten. Uh, and, and Akhenaten's son was the person that we call King right. Tut. So if you understand the history, understand the chronology, you can focus your attention on, on subject matters that are more worthy of discussion than, than Cleopatra. Not to dismiss her summarily, but, but Cleopatra is about as significant as Meghan Markle. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. Right, right. Put context is everything. Right. Context is everything. Right. So, Look at, and, and there, thank you for that image of Queen T. Now, that's a very small mm -hmm. image of Queen mm -hmm. T. And what I would also uh, suggest those of your listeners who, who live in New York, go to the Metropolitan Museum, the Met Museum, and you'll see an image of Queen T in the Met Museum. But that image of Queen T has half of her face destroyed. Mm -hmm. And there was an mm -hmm. article that was written in the 1970s that was an attack against African Center scholars. And Asa Hillier brought this uh, knowledge to our attention. The people from the New York Times had interviewed him um, as part of the same debate that folk are having right now about Cleopatra and African history. Um, and Asa Hillier showed this image of Queen T. And this image of Queen T, I love it so much because it reminds me so much of my dear friend, uh, Dr. Francis Chris yes. Wilson, with the Afro, the stern yep. look, uh, and a woman who, who was clearly in control of herself and her destiny. So Asa referenced that face of Queen T in the Metropolitan Museum with half the face knocked mm -hmm. off. So they mm -hmm. had an opportunity, the New York Times had an opportunity to tell the truth, but they chose not to. Right. And so these are the games that we're playing with. And we have to, 
you know, be very careful about who we uh, get our information from. We should read everything, but read everything with a critical eye so that you can discern when someone is being deceptive. You can discern when you're seeing you're being immersed into aspects of the truth so that you can ground yourself on the truth and not be led astray by arguments or false narratives that is designed to neutralize your your strength, your power, and and, and to waste time. Yes. No, we really don't have any time to waste. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, uh, pause it right there. All right, uh, when we come back, uh, I'm gonna let you hear, uh, we'll switch gears and I'll let you hear an excerpt of a classic interview I did with Renoko Rashidi. And we talked about Joseph Boulogne the Chevalier of France, the Chevalier uh, de Saint uh, de Saint George's uh, of France, and the new movie Chevalier is about him and the French Revolution. You listen to the African History Network show on Michael M. Hotel. We'll be back in a few minutes. Stand by, everybody. All right, um, I saw somebody who donated through youtube uh elliot c okay thanks so much for your support but uh if you all can do it through paypal or cash app that's better because um when you do it through youtube they take like a third of the donations and they only pay out once a month whereas if you do it through cash app or paypal it's immediate we get it right away okay and they don't take out nearly as much as YouTube does. Um, so dollar sign the AHN show through Cash App and through PayPal, paypal.me forward slash the AHN show. Uh, we have it here. I'm going to post it here. And it's right on the homepage of our website, the African History Network.com. Welcome back to the African History Network show. All right. Um, in the a few minutes that we have left here, I wanted to talk about, um, I wanted to share an excerpt of an interview that I did with uh, Renoko Rashidi. And this was uh, April 17th, 2017. Okay, April 17th, 2017. Uh, the new movie that's out called Chevalier uh, deals with Joseph Boulogne, Boulogne uh, who was a uh, famous violin player. He's known as the Black Mozart, um, and he uh, lived in France. He was a confidant of um, uh, Marie Antoinette. He lives during the uh, French Revolution uh, also, and he was of African descent as well. There's an article from CNN.com called Chevalier or the so-called Black Mozart had a fascinating life. Now it's at the heart of a movie. Now it's at the heart of a movie. And uh, I want to go to this clip here because we uh, talked to Renoko Rashidi about this back in uh, 2017. Okay, uh, let's go to uh, let's go to clip number three, Doug. Come back to it in a minute. All right. Uh, now, Renoko also wrote an article for um, AtlantaBlackStar.com on this subject of Joseph Boulogne. And it is uh, the name of the article is uh, Joseph Boulogne, the Chevalier de Saint George's of France, uh, is from uh, July 6, 2014. July 6, 2014. And he wrote a number of uh, articles for AtlantaBlackStar.com that are still there. Once again, we know uh, we lost Renoko August of 2021. Uh, so check out this article as well. And this is what this new movie is about, Chevalier. Uh, the history of, let me see. Uh, okay, his name is Joseph Boulogne, known to history as the Chevalier de St. George's. Um, the history of African people is so vast yet so spectacular that one hardly knows where to begin. And this is not just the history of nations and kingdoms and communities, but of outstanding individuals of great men and women. One of the most extraordinary of these individuals comes to us in the 18th, in 18th century Europe 
and he draws our attention like a magnet. He's talking about Joseph Boulogne. Okay, do we have do we have the clip ready to go? Well, the greatest of the French philosophers during that period of time is, and remember, this is all new to me too. I'm learning the whole process. The greatest of the French philosophers is Voltaire, and then yes. you're followed by a, a whole nother you know era from the time that um, the Chevalier de Saint Georges died. And by the way, the word Chevalier means knight in French, so he became a knight. His father was a a French nobleman, and his mother apparently was the most beautiful woman, the mu most beautiful African woman in the island of Mart. I'm um, sorry, not Martinique, Guadeloupe. And um, so, at a young age, uh, Joseph Boulogne goes to France, and because of his father's status, he receives a superior education. You know, he was able to excel in many, many things. So, on the one hand, his race is not a complete impediment, but he was only able to rise so far. Just to, mm -hmm. end, to get to your question, but add a bit more information, he's also known as uh, uh, the Black Mozart. And Mozart yes. actually had to come to him and ask him for a job. You know, Mo Joseph Boulogne was the head of the French, I think the French opera. And, and Mozart actually came and asked him for a job. Um, Joseph Boulogne was an associate of Marie Antoinette. He set the, the, um, the trends for fashion. And he's just a, a really remarkable person. So he dies around 1800, 1795, 1794, 1800, and 1795, that period of time. And right after that, you have the Dumas family. You have the, this family mm -hmm. of African descendant people from Haiti. And, of course, Alexander Dumas is the person who wrote The Three Musketeers and The Count of Monte Cristo and The Man in the Iron Mask. And he is a contemporary of people like Victor Hugo. Victor Hugo right. is the Charles Dickens of France. Victor Hugo wrote um, the book, which was called uh, Notre Dame, which came to be known to history as the Hunchback of Notre Dame. And he also wrote the book Les Miserables, where he talks about mm -hmm. Jean Valjean, the man who was arrested as a young person for stealing a loaf of bread to feed his family and was given like a 20-year prison sentence, something like that and who eventually got out of prison and spent most of the rest of his life trying to uh, duck and dodge from his criminal past. And so there's a discussion about class differences as well between the haves and the have-nots. And he's a contemporary of Emil Zola. And Emil Zola was the person who wrote a, about a famous trial called the Dreyfus Trial. And so all of these you know, people were talking about the status not necessarily of black people per se, but the status of class and the haves and the have-nots. So all of this is a part of this period that Joseph Boulogne is said to have lived. And the lesson, I suppose, um, that comes out of this for me is that all history is interconnected. Just to yes. make a fantastic leap, for example, and something that I'm learning right now and trying to incorporate in my work is the fact that the civil rights movement in the United States, what we call the U.S. Civil Rights Movement, beginning in the mid-1950s, and that led to the Black Power Movement in the 1960s, cannot be separated from the African Liberation Movement in Africa. That Martin Luther King was a keen observer of the African Liberation struggle. That Dr. King went to Africa several times, and so did Coretta Scott King, for that matter. Correct. Dr. King Correct. was in Africa at the time of um, the independence of Ghana. Martin Luther King mm -hmm. went to Jamaica 57. and spoke glowingly at the shrine of Marcus Garvey. And so there was a black power movement in Australia. There was a Garvey movement in Australia. And so I guess what I'm trying to do is, in a sense, with all of this, is connect the dots and to show that black history is everybody's history, that you can't separate one from the other, and that all of these phenomena are interconnected. Absolutely, absolutely. And, you know, I don't know if you know Professor Manu and Pim uh, out of California, yeah. man, but, he, mm -hmm. oh, okay, yeah, because he, he has some, he has, I, I've some, done some interviews with him dealing with the distortion 
of the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Man, Dr. King is one of the most misunderstood people in history. His legacy has just been totally distorted. And um, a lot of people don't know about him studying African history, him being a keen observer of the, the uh, uh, of Africa's liberation movements, things like this, that, that that's, you know, totally not talked about when, when we talk about Dr. King. Um, yeah, uh, also, very quickly here, in, in this article, you also talk about uh, Cole Nowhere, the Nowhere Law of Blacks. Um, it, it, talk about that a little bit, because when we hear about the French, we hear about Paris, France, and things like this, but we don't hear about them oppressing African people that much. I guess those who really study African history, we know about the French and the colonies, things like this, but in general, you really don't hear about this, uh, about the French. Well, no, not, I suppose not. You hear stories about people like Josephine Baker or mm -hmm. people like Richard Wright and Langston Hughes. All of them came to France and lived in France, one of Richard Wright's daughters. And, of course, for those who don't know Richard Wright, we're talking about the author of books like Black Boy and Native mm -hmm. Son, classical African-American literature, you might say. So right. in many ways, I think... A lot of African Americans, at least, have viewed France and Paris in particular as a haven uh, against white supremacy. And mm -hmm. I suppose for African Americans, that may be true to some extent. You know, I've rarely encountered, uh, you know, overt racism in France. I've been coming here for over 10 years now, and um, I like it here. It's a good experience. Lots of Africans mm -hmm. here, lots of museums, great public transportation. Expensive, but beyond that, it's not a bad place. But for Africans from the continent of Africa itself, or Africans who don't have money, Africans who don't have what are, what are generally known as papers, you know, it's a hell on earth. And let me add, mm -hmm. too, that each colonial power employed different techniques for dealing with their colonial subjects. And one of the things that the French did was to incorporate a sense of French identity, however false and frivolous that might be. You know, I meet people even now from countries like, Demo not Democratic Republic of Congo, but Congo Brazzaville or French Congo, you know, or, or Gabon or Central African Republic, countries that have been, at least on paper, independent for 50 years or more, who go around saying, I'm French. You don't mm -hmm. encounter sisters and brothers from Jamaica or Nigeria or Ghana, you know, um, as poor as some of these countries are, although the material wealth is, you know, should make them very wealthy. You don't hear these sisters and brothers going around saying, I'm English. But right. the French did a marvelous job. You know, when I say marvelous, I'm saying that with some degree of sarcasm. I'm applauding my enemy to an extent. They did a, a wonderful job in incorporating a sense of French identity. And so people, in many cases, feel like their loyalty is to France. And then the Dutch mm -hmm. did their own particular job. And the Germans and the Belgians and the Portuguese and the Spanish. For example, the Portuguese developed a group of people called the Assimilados, you know, who were largely the offspring of the Portuguese and Africans and put them in charge. And so the French are, are very similar to that. The French were some of the most effective colonizers, very, very racist, and a lot of us just don't know about that. And that's something that troubles me a great deal. You know, I spend a lot of time on Facebook as well as you know, and one mm -hmm. of the things that strikes me, in fact, I, I should do, I, you know, I've got several other articles coming up uh, soon in the land of Black Star, but okay. I see their format. And one of the, the things that they do is they might say 10 you know, great Africans who they need to make a movie about, or the five Africans right. who we need to emulate, or five classical civilizations that weren't in Africa but were black, things like that. But one of the right. things, if I ever get the time, I'd like to write is, like, the, what are the greatest myths of Africa? I don't know how I jumped to this point, but one of these myths might be <laughs> that Africa is not named after a Roman general. Or that right, the reason exactly. Africans are scattered around the world is not because of, of Pangea. Right. You know, things, things of that nature. And the other thing is, you know, you I guess stuff, the point man. I was going to make, and I want to say this and, and then I'll shut up for a moment. I guess I'm sleep deprived. Is um, 
Oh my God, I for, <laughs> it's almost four o'clock in the morning. Um, you were talking about, about the myths. The, yeah, uh, I was talking about the uh, myths, but there's one myth in particular that I wanted to introduce. I guess it'll come back to me, brother. Sorry about that. Okay, yeah, yeah, but Pangea is a good one. I can email you some things. Uh, yeah, Africa was named after Sierra. Here we go, here we go, here we go, here we go, here go, here go. I got it. Maybe the thing that frustrates me, frustrates me on Facebook the most is when I make a post and people say, I didn't know that. No, they don't say, I didn't know that. They typically say, they didn't tell me that. Uh, we didn't learn this in school as if it's the responsibility of other people to teach us our history, that we have become so intellectually lazy, let's be real, and so psychologically mm -hmm. dependent that even though many of us say that the European is the enemy of Africa or Africans, that we still expect that enemy to teach us our history. And when you look at that, you realize how slavery <coughs> excuse me, and colonialism has reduced us psychologically as a group of people. So anyway, I could ramble on and on, you know, about that, mm. but those are some so points right. I wanted to make in attempting to yeah. address your question in some way, form, or fashion. Um, we have that, uh, I, I re-aired the, that segment uh, with my interview from uh, with Renoka Rashidi, we posted it again on our YouTube channel, uh, Michael M. Hotep, I M H O T E P. We'll be rebroadcasting that this week. You can check it out there. That's my full interview with uh, Renoka Rashidi. All right. Uh, visit our website, theafricanhistorynetwork.com, theafricanhistorynetwork.com. You can support us there. Um, and watch the broadcast on our social media platforms as well. We're out of time here right now. It's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. We'll talk to you next week. Peace. So I teach two online history classes, Saturdays, uh, 2 p.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa. Understand the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. The slides I was showing you, those are all slides from the online classes I teach. We do the sessions live. All the sessions are archived and recorded. You can go back and watch them anytime. A year from now, two years from now, you can go back and watch the entire course. We deal with thousands of years of history and what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. When we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, we can't start our history in slavery. We have to deal with thousands of years of history that leads up to it taking place. Uh, so if you missed our class Saturday, April 22nd, as soon as you register, you can go back and watch it. Class is on sale $60, regularly $130. This helps support the research, helps support the African History Network, helps us broadcast the show. You can click right here. We have a video that gives an overview of the classes. Uh, we have a bundle pack. You can register for both classes that I teach right now. Limited time only $100. It's a $300 value. Uh, you'll get five of my lectures in digital format free. Also, they'll be in the video library. The second class I teach on Sundays, uh, and uh, we're teaching the class today, is going to be 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Um, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement, 1800 to 1968. And we go through a look at history chronologically from 1800 to 1968, what leads up to the Civil War taking place. We look at the Reconstruction Era, 1865, 1877, uh, Jim Crow Era. Great Migration, World War I, World War II, Civil Rights Movement, Black Power Movement. To understand what happened to us after slavery ended, what were the laws and policies put in place to put us in the predicament we're in today to understand where we need to go from here, okay? So this class picks up basically where the first one leaves off, okay? It's a crucial, crucial class. I put together the curriculum for both of these courses, been studying history 31 years. Uh, we deal with, um, this about, uh, in both of these classes, there's about 80 or so articles that we reference, uh, books that we reference, there's a ton of information, okay? Uh, so we're teaching the class today, uh, 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, black resistance movements from the Haitian Revolution, U.S. Civil War, Civil Rights Movement, and Black Power Movement. Okay, so you can register for those classes. And uh, very quickly here, uh, I'll show you uh, just a, a brief introduction uh, to understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. And 
that uh, I've been teaching this class on and off uh, since 2017. OK. Uh, we use two of Tony's books in the class. Uh, we use two books from Renoko Rashidi as well. Uh, and there's a uh, yeah, in yesterday's class, there was a uh, interview that I did with uh, Renoko uh, back in 2014. And we talked about Chevalier, Joseph Ballone, uh, who the movie Chevalier is about. All right. So I'm about to re-release that interview uh, to let people hear that information uh, also. OK, let me show you this here quickly. And uh, we dealt with this. Uh, we just had our class on Saturday. Fantastic class. Uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understand the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, I'll post the link uh, here. Mississippi River. Now, you know, uh, somebody asked about the Mississippi River. You know, Memphis, Tennessee is named after Memphis in Egypt. OK, we talk we talk about this in the class. Memphis, Tennessee is named after uh, Memphis in Egypt. And one of the founders of uh, Memphis, Tennessee, was uh, General Andrew Jackson, who then became President Andrew Jackson. And uh, Memphis, Tennessee sits at the uh, mouth of the Delta, the Mississippi River. And the Mississippi River was looked at to be the Nile River of America. It, it, the Mississippi River is looked at as the American Nile. Uh, civilizations are built along uh, long rivers. Civilizations were built upon uh, along the Nile River. Uh, this is something that Dr. John Henry Clark talked about as well. Okay, now, uh, so there's a relationship between Memphis, Tennessee, and Memphis and Egypt. Now, we can't start studying our history in slavery, even when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade. Uh, we can't start in 1619. I know the 1619 project is out. There's some good information in there. There's some problems with the 1619 project as well. I wouldn't say ban it or anything like that. But um, African people been in the land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. So we can't start in 1619 or the 1440s when the Portuguese get involved. 1441 with Anton Gonzalez going into Mauritania, taking out about 12 Africans, taking, taking them back to Portugal. We have to understand the history chronologically and deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors who entered the Iberian Peninsula today known as Spain and Portugal from uh, North Africa in uh, 711 AD led by Tariq Ibn Ziyad. So in yesterday's class, uh, we talked about uh, the Moors going in fighting against the Banos and the Visigoths and some of the things that the Moors introduced into Europe. And it's going to be the teachings that the Moors take into Europe that bring Europe out of the Dark Ages. So when you register for uh, ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade where they didn't teach you in school. Uh, you can watch yesterday's class. So this course not only deals with the transatlantic slave trade, but thousands of years of history that leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. Uh, August 20, 1619 marked the 400th year anniversary of those 20 and odd Africans or 20 and odd Negroes uh, coming into Point Comfort on, on the White Lion pirate ship. It was a pirate ship. It was an English pirate ship on August 20, 1619 in what would later be called the Colony of Virginia. This year was known as the year of return as many African-Americans were and continue to reconnect to Africa and, and are traveling to Ghana and other West African countries. When we discuss the transatlantic slave trade, we have to first understand that African people are the original people of North, Central and South America and have been in the land we call the United States of America at least 51,700 years. So as we talked about with Tony, Dr. David M. Hotel, the first Americans were Africans documented evidence, his book. His second book came out in October of 2021. The first Americans were Africans revised and expanded. On page 14 of his book, he deals with uh, evidence uh, found in Allendale County in South Carolina by Dr. Albert Goodyear, who's an archeologist at the University of South Carolina. Uh, this was a discovery made in 2004, and they found 13 different types of evidence to to thoroughly document an African presence in the land we call the United States of America going back at least 51,700 years ago. They found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, um, footprints and lava, genetic M174, the haploid groups dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, painting, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools. They found 13 different types of evidence. This is why we can't start our history in slavery. The original people of the land that we today we call the United States of America were African people. 
Okay, these were the Khoisan. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. They come from Southern Africa. They're the ancestors to the Ainu and the, and the Twa, the short statured Africans. All right. Now, here's a picture of Dr. Albert Goodyear. He's a white archaeologist um, at the University of South Carolina. This is an article from ScienceDaily.com that came out November 18, 2004. The name of this article is called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. The article is still there. You can go read it yourself. You can go research it yourself, okay? Um, radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains were where artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that uh, humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. Okay, now who were these humans? Were these brown-skinned Caucasians? Were these Europeans? Were these Asians? 51,700 years ago. Who, who, who were these people? There were no Europeans on the planet 51,700 years ago. There were, there were no Asians. Okay. Who were these people? The people who we call Native Americans, they didn't exist 51,700 years ago. These were the Khoisan. Now, an October 2012 genetic study published in Science Magazine found that the Khoisan in Southern Africa are the oldest ethnic group of modern humans with their ancestral line originating about 100,000 years ago. The Khoisan formerly called the, uh, by the derogatory term Bushmen, formerly called by the derogatory term Bushmen, are genetically unique by uh, genetically unique and no other currently known population had separated so early from our common modern human ancestor, according to the report. Okay, now here are two Khoisan women. These are the short statured Africans. Okay, now the Khoisan live mainly in Southern Africa in territory spanning Botswana, Namibia, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and South Africa. They are largely divided into two groups, hunters and gatherers, known as the Sans people, S-A-N-S, and keepers of the livestock, known as the Khoi Khoi people. The Khoisan languages include the distinctive click sounds that are not found in the languages of their neighbors. So AtlantaBlackStar.com had a good article called uh, Five Ethnic Groups that prove the first humans were black. Five ethnic groups that prove the first humans were black, okay? So th this is just a sample of the type of information we do within this class. Uh, it's a 12-week online course. We deal with thousands of years of history. Uh, we look at archeological uh, discoveries that have come out in the last uh, 15, maybe going back 20 years. Uh, we look at the uh, discovery of Thomas Heracleon, uh, that was discovered, that, that was revealed in 2013. They have been doing the excavation even before then. And this is the lost city of Egypt that was uh, uh, built around 8th century BC, okay, lost for about 1,200 years, the lost city of Egypt. And they found 16-foot tall statues, gold coins. They found uh, dozens of ship anchors, things like this at the, at the bottom of the sea, all right? We deal with different archaeological discoveries like this one coming out of Morocco in 2017. Uh, this one, it, it now what we see as more and more of these archeological discoveries come out, uh, we see that the deeper they dig, the blacker the planet gets, the more research they do, the older we get, all right? So this discovery here pushed back the timeline about 100,000 years. And uh, people like Dr. Charles Finch, who, to uh, who Tony Browder mentioned, People like Renoko Rashidi and other scholars, they've been saying that Homo sapiens are at least 300,000 years old and not 75,000 to 100,000 years old. So this is an article from NBCNews.com where we're older than we thought. New find pushes human origin back 100,000 years. This is an article from June 7, 2017. I remember the date because that's my birthday. It's not just Prince's birthday. It's my birthday also. Uh, modern humans evolved much earlier than previously thought researchers reported. New discoveries at a rich site in Morocco show modern humans were hunting and probably cooking game animals 300,000 years ago, 100,000 years 
earlier than scientists have believed until now. So when these discoveries come out, they keep they, they have to keep pushing the timelines back. You know, Juvenile had that song called Back That Thing Up, okay, like 1988, 99. They keep having to back that thing up. They keep having to back the timelines up when all this, when these 